Hey guys, I hope you enjoy this week's sermon. If you're interested in getting connected here more at the sanctuary, you can visit us at our website at tscwest.org or you can check us out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all of the things. I hope you enjoy this message. Amen. Amen. Man, yeah, what a blessing. What a blessing to be here with you guys. You know, Pastor, you said that I was a gift for you. Well, I just want to tell you this morning that you all have been a gift for me. Um, to be able to be in a place where there's freedom to worship and freedom to be touched by God in fellowship and in relationship to it. Freedom for expression, people to dance, celebrate, get on their face. You know, I grew up in a church where we thought that was kind of crazy, you know? And it is kind of crazy, right? And that's okay, right? I'm a little bit crazy. Anybody else a little bit crazy, right? <laughs> I mean, I grew up in a church where, you know, if somebody raised their hand, we thought they had a question. <laughs> I think you had to be angry if you were in church. <laughs> I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. If you know it, will you sing it with me? I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you. time. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to Father, we come to you because we want to know you the way that you know us. We want to abide in you. We want to live in you. We want to be known by you and we want to know you. And we want to see others come to know you because you change everything. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way for us where there was no way. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us, strengthening us, giving us the ability to do what you have called us to do, to live as you have called us to live, to walk closely in fellowship with you. Father, I pray today that you would open hearts, open minds, that you would help us to see your face, and that when we see your face, we will be changed. We love you. Could you just take about 10 seconds and just tell them that you love them? Just whisper to them, I love you, God. Could we just hear whispers all over the room? I love you, God. I love you. I need you. I trust you. I worship you. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for empowering me, God. We love you. We want you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love the Lord so much. And I'm truly blown away how much he loves me. H have you gotten over it yet? Have you gotten over it? You know, like, well, he loves me, you know. Sometimes it feels like we kind of, oh, the cross, oh, the blood, you know. Now I don't feel that here. <laughs> but I pray the Lord would just awaken us again this morning to who he is, who he is, what he's done, who he is, what he has for us, all that he has for us. Amen? Amen. I, wanna, I do want to show you a couple of pictures because my family is very, very important to me. So do we have a picture of my family? I think we do. <clears throat> so there they are. Uh, that's my amazing wife, Martha, there. We have been married for 32 years. Come on, man. <clears throat> 
actually our anniversary was on Thursday. So May 23rd, come on those May anniversaries, all right? And then uh, my four, our amazing four children, we've got Roman on the right, we got Evan on the left, we got Channing there down front, and then we hung in there and we got the girl, you know what I'm saying, all right? Praise the Lord, that's Clara Joyce. And, you know, we're, we're really into what we name our kids. The names are important to us, what the meanings of the names are. And so when we were thinking about names for Clara, we thought, well, this, this, her name means bright and famous one. Well, I got to be honest. I, I spent a lot of time in Nashville, 17 years, lived there, traveling, touring, all that stuff. I'm not a huge fan of the word famous. And so I was like, well, I love the name Clara, but I don't love the bright and famous. I like the bright one, but I don't like the famous word. But the Holy Spirit corrected me. He's like, Jeff, you're misunderstanding. You're thinking too small. I'm not talking about famous in the natural. I'm talking about famous in the supernatural. You know, she's going to make demons tremble because she's got the power of the Spirit of God living inside of her. You know what I'm saying? And she's going to have the angels celebrating with her because they know Clara Joyce. And I said, fine, we'll name them all Clara. You know what I'm saying? Just Clara 1, Clara 2. You know what I'm saying? But that's my kids. That's my family. They're my family. I love them so much. Now, I spent some time, as uh, Pastor E was saying, that at North Central University, I think we have a picture of that too, North Central University, our chapel, um, maybe, there it is, yep, there it is, um, been there for about almost 15 years, I just finished up my final semester, uh, God's doing some new things in, in my life, but it's been a blessing to be able to pour into these students, into the next generation, and raise up worshipers, and worship leaders, and I'm telling you, man, what you have here at the sanctuary, can we just give it up for the worship team? I mean, man... And when I say that, too, I mean everybody in the back there that's helping out as well. You're part of the worship team as well. Come on. Come on. All right. You, what you have, I don't know. Matt, many of you have been to other churches, so you know that what you have here is very special. Right? I mean, am I right? Right? I mean, there's not a lot of churches on a Sunday morning where you're just going to let loose for like 45, 50, 60 minutes or whatever and be free. And we're just going to sing spontaneous in the spirit. And we're just going to move and we're going to flow. So it's a blessing. And don't ever take that for granted. You have something very, very special here. I'm so grateful for that. But I've, I'm developing these students because I want them to flow like this team is flowing. Then there's just a couple of resources I brought. I wrote a book called Spark. Uh, this is a book that's supposed to help. I just have a huge passion for the creatives, for the musicians, for the singers. And I see how we can get into so many traps. So I wrote a book called Spark. You know, I had a lot of different textbooks that I would use in my classes when I teach worship leading. Uh, but I just could never find one and said it the way I wanted to say it. So I wrote my own, you know? I mean, I just said, okay, I'm going to write the own, my own textbook. But so if, you, if you're a musician or a creative or even just somebody who just loves as the, the, the gatherings of the body of Christ, I'm just passionate about what God has for the kingdom, for the body of Christ. It's a book, Spark. And then I wrote a book called uh, Awakening Pure Worship, as Pastor E was saying. Uh, this is a book that really is just my journey. I told you I grew up in a church where we didn't understand this stuff. We did two songs standing up, two songs sitting down, four hymns. We went through, you know, stanzas one, two, and four. We never did sing stanza three. I don't know. It was just taking too long or what, you know. Uh, but <laughs> we, and, and again, it was a good experience. I mean, there's theology happening there. There's community happening there, which is part of our worship. But I had no concept that we could actually have a connection with God relationally through the music as we sing. And so I'm so grateful that God has awakened in me his heart for worship. And I want to talk about some of that this morning. I want to talk about a few thoughts that the Lord has given me from this book that he had me put in this book. Okay, so I want you to understand that anything that's in this book, it came from this book. Anybody a fan of this book right here? All right. So technically, if you read this book, you don't need this book. You know what I'm saying? Because I just got my ideas from this book, which the Holy Spirit downloaded in my heart. It's been just a life journey of mine to grow closer to God. That subtitle of Awakening Pure Worship is just cultivating a closer friendship with God. 
Does it blow your mind that the God of the universe wants to be your friend? I mean, I, I, it's almost too big that you can't even really think about it, but it blows my mind. Like think about all of the other religions in the world. Think about any of the other gods that you know their names. Is there any other God that wants to have fellowship with his people? I mean, this is one of the greatest differences between Christianity and every other religion is that God, we know the blood of Jesus is what makes Christianity unique, Jesus himself, but the purpose of Jesus coming was so that we could be restored to fellowship with God. Even as we worship, I have a friend who, who said this, he said, you know, remember that we don't worship to gain God's affection. We worship because we already have it. Come on, come on, come on. So this book that I wrote is not really so much about musical worship, because I see music as part of our expression to God, right? I think music is a springboard that helps us. It's easy to worship music too, though. So we can walk, walk, watch out for those types of traps. But God has, so the, the book itself is not so much about musical worship. It's about connection with God. Take this quote. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. It says this. It says, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a bottom line person. I want to know what it's all about. Because if there's no purpose, I'm ready to go home. You know what I'm saying? Like if we're just here to just clock in and clock out, or we're just here to kind of get the goosebumps and go home and go eat lunch, you know? I, I was praying to the Lord a few weeks ago, and I was like, God, I am so tired of three songs, a message, and let's go to lunch, you know? And that's not what you have here. You have something special here, right? But the Lord, think about this quote here. Think about this quote. The bottom line, I, I want to ask this question, like, what is the point of life? Why do I exist? What has God made me for? Has he made me go for, to go to church? Has, me, has he made me to listen to sermons? Has he made me to be forced to read his Bible so that we can feel better about ourselves? No, he's made us for a preoccupation. Now, I love this quote because I love the way people use words. Anybody else like words? I just like words in the way that we can use them to help people think and how they can help us come awake again. This word preoccupation is usually a word that we use in the negative, right? You might be sitting out there, you're like, Jeff, I'm sorry, I was so preoccupied thinking about lunch that I didn't hear a thing you said. You know, we think about that preoccupation. It's like a bad thing. It's a negative thing. But here, A.W. Tozer flips this on us, and he says, you know what? What if you were so preoccupied with God that you forgot to be afraid? I mean, I meant to be afraid, Aaron. You know, I was going to be afraid. There was lots of reasons to be afraid. But I was so focused on God that I forgot to be afraid. Oh, man, what if you were so preoccupied? Some of you are getting this. What if you were so preoccupied with God that you forgot about your anxiety? You see, I think sometimes we're so preoccupied with anxiety, we've taken our eyes off of God, and we're preoccupied with our problems. <laughs> what if you were so preoccupied with God you forgot about your addiction? You're like, oh, wait, wasn't I supposed to? <laughs> I was, wait, I was supposed to feel that feeling that I needed that thing, and I forgot because I was just lost in his presence. What if it was a lifelong pursuit of preoccupation with God and everything else just fell off? What if you were so preoccupied with God you forgot to sin? Am I allowed to say that? You know, like, think about that. What if you forgot to sin? I was going to sin. I'm used to sinning, but I was so focused on the goodness of God, I forgot to sin. Whew. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Change our perspective. This is about perspective, right? It's about perspective. So I want to read the word. If you have a Bible, it would be awesome. Or if you have the Bible in the front there, pull it out. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. 
I want to read a scripture here that I, I call the one thing scripture. I think a lot of people call this the one thing. I told you I'm a bottom line person. Remember Luke 10, Luke 10. I'm a bottom line person. I want to know what is this all about? I'm so tired. I mean, this book is complicated, right? There's a lot of stuff in here. But when Jesus was asked, hey, what's the, what's the most important commandment? What did he say? Do you remember? That's one of them. The very first one, he said, there's two, two commandments. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So I, we dumbed it down. And, and in our family, when our kids leave for school, I say two things. And they say, love God, love people. That's it. There it is right there, right? That's the Bible. That's the book. Luke chapter 10, the one thing scripture. This helps me understand what is this all about? Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Verse 38 reads like this. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet. What did she do? She sat at the Lord's feet, listening. Come on, we're listening this morning, right? You're not listening to Jeff Dio. You're listening. What does the Spirit of God want to say to you this morning? Sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted. Now, I don't want to change the Word of God here, but what could we maybe put that word preoccupied in there? She was preoccupied by the big dinner she was preparing she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Sounds like my kids. <laughs> Sometimes me, actually. <laughs> but the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset, possibly preoccupied with all these details. Now, verse 42. There is only, what does it say? How many things? Now, who's speaking here? Jesus, God, right? Jesus, he is God. Verse 42, there's only how many things? One thing. See, this is helping me. I'm like, because there's so many things, right? There's so many. What do I got to do? What do I got to do to make it to heaven? What do I got to do to be right? What do I got to do to be healed, to be whole, to be healthy? And Jesus makes it so simple said there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. So Father, as we linger on your word and understanding what you are calling us to, that one thing, Lord, would you open our hearts? Do what only you can do in this place. Lord, I can't change anybody, but you change all of us. You open our hearts. You open our minds. Your word changes us. So God, would you come and do what you can do, what only you can do, and help us to see what that one thing is. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, I want to give you four quick things. Four quick things. Number one, God places before us an unimaginable invitation. What is it an invitation to? It's an invitation to close fellowship. This is what life is all about. It's why you were created. You might have asked yourself, what am I here for? What am I on this planet for? And you're thinking, what am I going to do? And we talk about this a lot, right? It's not so much about doing, it's about being. You're not a human doing, are you? <sighs> You have been created to be, and to first and foremost, to be with God. It's an invitation. I don't know if there's anybody in here on Facebook. <laughs> that used to be a college thing, now it's an old people thing. <laughs> but you know, on Facebook, and they'll have an invitation for you to come to an event or something, you know what I'm saying? You're like, nope. Yeah, well, if you're on Facebook, it has this invitation. And it used to be there was three options, but now it's like you can either click I'm going or you can click interested. Now, come on, let's be honest. If you click interested, you know you're not going. 
come on, somebody be honest, right? When I'm saying, right, you're just like trying to save face. You're just trying to, if I say interested, then they'll at least know that I care. <laughs> but you're not going, you know you're not. And it feels like in the church, sometimes there's this beautiful invitation that we have from God, and we just click interested. The question is, are you going? Are you accepting the invitation or are you preoccupied with some other things? Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. God places before us an unimaginable invitation. What it, I like to say this too. Uh, it's an invitation to intimacy. Now, I got to be honest. In the church I grew up, I was afraid of that word intimacy. Ladies, I'm sorry, but some of the metaphors in the Bible, they just don't go our way. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like the bride of Christ. We're all like, all the men are like, okay, I, I got this. It's a metaphor. Uh, I'm going to put on the wedding gown. Oh, my goodness. You know? And all the ladies are like, oh, it's the bride of Christ. Oh, I love it so much. You know? And ladies, help us out here. You know, we got, we, we got intimacy, lover of my soul. You know, all these like metaphors that sometimes it's hard for some of us to understand. And I didn't, I didn't like it, this idea of intimacy. I remember when I was in middle school, somebody pulled out Song of Solomon. Now, if you know what I'm talking about, this book, Song of Solomon, in the Bible, it's a big metaphor, right? But it talks about two lovers. And it's, and it's like this metaphor of how God sees us. But I'm in middle school, man. And so I'm just like really nervous and somebody's reading this passage to me for the first time, one of my friends or whatever. And it's like, oh my goodness, the Bible, you know? And they're reading this thing and I'm like, I don't want to hear about my girl's cheeks being like pomegranates. You know, I don't want to hear about her neck being a, like a tower of David. I don't want to hear about her teeth being as white as the sheep. And side note, if your girl's teeth are as white as the sheep, you might need to get her crest whitening strips. Because sheep are not really that white. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're not really, I'm not a farmer or anything, but I mean, I see some sheep. They're not, they're kind of dingy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the lastly, I definitely didn't want to hear about my girl's hair being like a flock of goats frisking down the slopes of Gilead. You know, I don't even think that's a compliment. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm like, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine, Seth? <laughs> Going to Rachel, <laughs> babe, baby, your hair. <laughs> it's like a flock of goats. He's like, <laughs> I don't think that's really a compliment. I don't know. I could be wrong. But, but see, what I didn't understand about all this is it's a metaphor, this intimacy thing. This isn't a sexual thing. But it is something where we would say that God wants such close fellowship with us that nothing is hidden. Yeah. Now, we all know that God sees it anyways, right? Nothing is hidden to him anyways. But we pretend like it's hidden. We pretend like he can't see. So what if we lived in a way where we know he does and we just open our hearts to him completely? This is what he made us for. It's an invitation to intimacy. Amen? Amen. You see, worship is not an obligation. It's an invitation. So many people in the church, so many people outside the church, they see church as an obligation. Oh, do we have to go to church? Do we have to do that so God will be happy with us? Do I have to read the word of God? Oh my goodness, it's so boring. You haven't read it if you think it's boring. This thing is alive. It's nourishment from my soul. Is there some things in here I don't understand? Yeah. <laughs> but his ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. See, some people are all about, well, it's an obligation. I have to. You know what, guys? If we could just learn one thing this morning, if we could move from I have to to I get to. Do I have to lift up my hands in worship? I wasn't raised that way. Well, you're in a new family now. Come on, somebody. The culture is shifting. You don't have to raise. Do I have to sing? I'm not really a singer. Oh, man, it was never about you being a singer. The Bible just says to make a joyful. What does it say? A joyful noise. noise. Somebody make a noise in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on. 
on. It was never about I have to sing. It's I get to sing to the creator of the universe and he wants to listen. How is it possible? How is it possible that he loves me? Oh, how he loves me. And you know, he, he never asked us to do anything that he didn't do first, Amen. right? He calls us to die to self. He did it first. And did you know that he sings over you? The Bible tells us in Zephaniah 317 that he sings over you with his great love for you. So he did it first. Now he's inviting you to join him. Praise God. Worship's not an obligation. It's an invitation. If you can move in your life from I have to to I get to, we can have the altar call right now. <laughs> Number two, the cross is a beginning, not an end. Now hear me. Hear me, because we are not trying to diminish the cross. I'm just telling you that there are many people who see the cross as the finish line when it's really just the starting blocks. It's, a, it's the starting blocks that we could never have. What do I mean? Well, what if I said this? Jesus didn't die for your sins. Wait, wait, don't throw anything, okay? That's not very nice. Just let me finish, all right? Listen, I'm thinking purpose here. What is the purpose? What is the reason that Jesus died? Did he die to forgive us of our sins? Well, yes, but there's something bigger. What if I said it this way? Jesus didn't die for your sins. He died to reconcile you to the Father. And your sins were just standing in the way. Come on, so many people in this world, but come on. So many people in this world think that the end goal is forgiveness. That's just the beginning. It's the beginning of freedom. It's the beginning of fellowship. It's the beginning of relationship, restored, reconciled relationship with the Father. Oh, man. Come on, we're thinking bigger now. You know, we're thinking bigger. Yes, we have to be forgiven. And praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. There was no way, but he made a way. Uh, let me, let me, you're, you're like, Jeff, what about some scripture? Okay, let's look at John 14, 6. If you've been around the church, you probably have heard this verse. You could probably quote it with me, right? John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now listen, church, what if I said to you that that verse is not about Jesus? You're like, Jeff, if there's any verse in the Bible that's about Jesus, it's John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I think we forgot about the back half of the verse. What does it say? No one, four words, comes to the Father. Maybe I could ask you if Jesus is the way, what is he the way to? See, a lot of people think he's just the way to forgiveness or a better life, a way to freedom. And yes, those things are true, but he said that the, those four words, that's the point of it all, to come to the Father. The Father sent Jesus on his behalf to make a way where there was no way. Now listen, Jesus calls himself the door. But this is what happens sometimes, guys. You have, okay, what used to be a wall, right? There was a wall here. God's over there. We're over here. We're disconnected because of our sin. But God doesn't want it to stay that way. So he's got this plan. He sends Jesus, right? And so now we have a wall where there was a wall. Now there's a door. Or maybe it's a gate, right? The Bible says Jesus is the gate. And people will come up to the gate and they'll say, wow, what a beautiful gate. Praise the gate, worship the gate, and we should. But then people go, done, and walk away. What are doors for? To go through. Come on, what do you say? To go through. To go through, right? So many people are in awe of the door, but they never use the door for what it was for. Wow. To open into restored fellowship 
with God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Yes, Lord. So yes, worship and honor the door because there was no way. But, oh, I would say it this way. Jesus says to us this morning, your gratitude for my extraordinary sacrifice on the cross honors me. However, the greatest thanks that you can offer is to step into the fellowship with my Father that the cross provides. Do you hear what I'm saying? If, and I, I think about this stuff a lot, you know. And we sing, and we should, please hear me. We sing a lot about the blood and the cross, and we should, we should be thankful. But I feel like sometimes Jesus is like, guys, I love it. You're awesome. Thank you for thanking me for the blood. But could you move into uh, what the blood provides for you? Could you start living in what the blood provides for you instead of just thanking me for the blood? Your thanks to me will be you living in fellowship with the Father. Amen? Help us, Lord. So number two was the cross, the beginning, not an end. Number three, we must avoid being absent in God's presence. Now, I was thinking about this coming here to the sanctuary because it is different. I travel to a lot of different churches, and I got to tell you, I can count on one hand. I mean, all over the country, churches that have worship and freedom like the sanctuary. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we just say more, Lord. We haven't arrived. We haven't arrived, right? No, we're just beginning. Come on, we're just scratching the surface of all that he has for us. He has more. But so when I think about this point, I've preached this sermon before because I feel like this is not a regurgitated sermon. Well, Jeff just kind of packages his sermon, comes in here and gets No, I feel like this is a foundational message that God has put inside of me to bring to the body of Christ. Okay? So, but a lot of churches where I go to and I talk about being absent in God's presence, it's more because people are like this in the worship. <sighs> Coffee. Hands in the pockets. They're absent in God's presence. Think about this word being in someone's presence. Like if I was in, my, in a room with my wife and the together we're in that room, you could say that we're physically in each other's presence, correct? Right? But what if she's reading a book and I'm scrolling on my phone? Are we relationally in each other's presence at that point? No, we're not. Many people go on dates like this. They sit side by side and watch a screen, but they're not connected relationally. They're just being entertained. People sit at restaurants across from each other, both on their phones. But we're on a date. <laughs> but we're not in each other's relational presence. So we get it. There's two types of God's presence. There's God's omnipresence. He's always with us, right? You can't escape his presence. Praise God. Whether you're in the heights of heaven or the depths of hell, God is there. Come on. Maybe that's a word for somebody today. You feel like you're in the depths of hell. God is with you. He is helping you. And he's going to pull you out. If you will grab his hand, he will help you. And he will transform your life today. But what I'm saying is that you could come into a room. And I feel like the Lord taught me this while I was leading worship one time. He said, Jeff, so many people come into a service. And they encounter songs. And they encounter musicians and personalities, great speakers and great musicians, and they encounter an atmosphere. And they walk out of the room believing they've encountered me. And there's been no relational connection with me at all. Help us, Lord, right? And so in some churches I go there, and it's because they're disconnected. They're not engaged. But in a church like this, the danger is the opposite, right? We could become enamored with the sounds and the feeling of moving and dancing and celebrating, and we begin to worship the experience rather than the God of the experience, right? And I'm not saying we need to pull the experience back. God is an experiential God, absolutely. But just don't let yourself become enamored with the music or the people or the experience become enamored with the God of it all. Amen? Because you could be in his presence and still be absent. 
Help us, Lord, to be present in your presence. Ephesians 3.12. Sometimes it feels like this, too. We, we have a, a, a different churches, different places I go, but it feels like sometimes we feel if we sing loud enough and we dance and we celebrate, then God will show up. But it's not so much about God showing up. We have the omnipresence of God, and then we have the manifest presence of God. It's a both and. God can be always present all the time, but he can also manifest his presence and move. We know in the Old Testament, he moved into the temple. And then sadly, he also moved out of the temple. And you and I are the temple now. But sometimes it feels like we're, we're more concerned with whether he will show up. I gotta be honest, I'm not concerned about him doing his part. I'm wondering if we're gonna show up. And yes, physically, that's, that's part of the battle, right? Like being here this morning is an important step to show up, but you could also be in the room and be absent in his presence. So he's just saying to you this morning, don't be absent. Ephesians 3.12 says, because of Christ, because of who? <laughs> See, we're not diminishing what Christ has done. In fact, he's the one that made this possible. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. <sighs> he tore the veil. He said, come, come to me. You don't have to come through a pastor or through another leader. Come directly through the blood of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. Hebrews 4.16 says, echoes that thought. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. Number four, and I could have the worship team come. Number four, and then just hear me, right? Number four, it might seem like, well, is there a, is there a typo there? <laughs> Worship is not for God. Now, just hang with me for a second because I'm talking about a preposition here. I told you I like words. This is not about me saying worship is about me, okay? We know that worship is about God completely. It can't be about anyone else. It can't be about anything else. Worship is about God. And worship should be directed to God. Amen? Amen? It's to him. But what if, like everything else in the kingdom, he's given you and I a gift? This thing called worship. It's a gift from him to you. Uh, let me just ask a question that will help clarify. Who has changed more when you worship God? You or God? <laughs> Right? I'm not speaking heresy here, am I? No. no, I'm just saying the first and foremost, we should worship God because he's worthy, right? But see, God's not a because I told you so, God. Sometimes as parents, that's how we are, right? Your kid's like, well, why not? I said, because I said so. Because <laughs> you couldn't think of why. I don't know. <laughs> it's dangerous, and I love you. And, you know, those are the reasons why you're saying no, really. But God always has a purpose, for his directives for us, right? And so if he calls us to worship him, it's not just because he said so, even though that's enough. I mean, it's enough, right? He's God. But if I'm thankful he's not a because I said, uh, told you so, God. He has a purpose. Who's changed when I lift my hand to God? He made me to lift my hands. So it changes me when I worship him. When I begin, I come into a place, I mean, I hate to confess this, but there are times as a worship leader that I don't feel like worshiping God. Anybody ever been there, you didn't feel like worshiping God? Now as believers, we don't go based on our feelings. Some people are worried, they're like, well, what if I worship God when I don't feel like it? Aren't I being fake? I'm like, no, think. We don't fake it to make it as believers, we faith it to make it. Come on, somebody. We faith it. We step out. When I don't feel like lifting up my voice, I lift my voice anyways. When I don't feel like dancing, I dance anyways. And something begins to shift in my heart when I begin to do what God made me to do. 
come on, he created me to worship him. So when I worship him, he is glorified and I am transformed. Can we stand up all over this place? Oh God, help us. What I want to do, I want to invite the prayer team to come. And if you've been here, you understand how this works. They're going to be up here. And what I would love to encourage you this morning as we sing, we want to offer a time of ministry. I want us to echo this, this whole message about come, right? It's an invitation to come into fellowship with God, to come and be healed. You know, it blows my mind that people will say, I just need peace. Is there anybody in the room that just said, I just need more peace? I just need peace, right? And so we try to find peace in so many other ways. But I'm telling you this morning, the place to find peace is in the presence of the Prince of Peace. Come on, we're trying to find peace outside of the Prince of Peace. There is no peace outside of the Prince of Peace. So we come. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you and invite you. I'm going I'm to ask you to do two things, okay? Number one, I'm going to ask you to increase your time at home alone in God's presence. You say, how, how can we apply this, Jeff? That was some great truth. Man, I love those one-liners. You know, we can put out, put out on an X or something like that, you know. Uh, good one-liners. Way to go, Jeff. No, we want to apply this message. So I would challenge everybody in this room, if you don't spend regular time every day with the Lord, again, this is not a heavy thing, it's an I get to thing. It's not that I have to spend time with God, I get to spend time with God. I want to be pre, are you preoccupied with your fear? Are you preoccupied with your job? Are you preoccupied with trying to make money? Are you preoccupied with your health? Are you preoccupied? Oh, I'm telling you, don't just seek the healing. I tell you, begin to seek the healer. Come on, you need provision. Don't just seek the provision. Seek the provider. Help us, Lord. So this is what we are seeking. We are coming into fellowship. So I would encourage you. I do a little thing called 10, 10, 10. 10, 10, 10 is, it, is the baseline of just some time with God. 10 minutes in prayer every day, 10 minutes in musical worship every day, and 10 minutes in the word every day. Come on. That's just baseline. Some of you guys are already doing 20, 20, 20. Some of you are doing 30, 30, 30. I don't know what it is. But just wherever you are, I would say bring increase. Just more of God in your life. If you need more peace, if you need more joy, anybody need joy in the house? Come on. We need joy. Come to the joy giver. So I challenge you today to spend more time. He's inviting you. Will you click interested or will you click going? And then as we sing, I would encourage you to come. This whole message is about coming. So make the walk from your pew to the front a metaphor of you coming into deeper, awakened fellowship with God. If you need healing in your body, if you need freedom from addiction, come. We will pray for you. We'll lay hands on you and believe that the power of God will set you free. But come into his presence and join us in seeking God above all things. I'll read this one verse and then we'll start singing and we'll come. To echo King David in Psalm 27, 8, he said this. This is my heart and this should be your heart, your prayer. Psalm 27, 8 says, my heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord I am coming. So would you let that be your response this morning to say, Lord, I am coming. And would you allow that walk from your pew to the front for prayer to be a symbol of you making that step in your life. So just come even right now as we begin to sing and receive prayer. Thank you, Lord.